Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar, Nutrition Plus Food Safety Equals Great Eating, Integrating Food Safety into Nutrition Education, presented by the Partnership for Food Safety Education. Here we go. <laughs> um, our presenters today, we're so pleased to have with us Janet M. DeJesus, MSRD. She's a public health advisor at the Center for Translation Research and Implementation Science at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute at the National Institute of Health. Also with you today, I'll be moderating and presenting. My name is Mary Saucier Choate. I'm an MSRD LD. Manager Outreach and Stakeholder Engagement here at the Partnership for Food Safety Education. We're so glad you're with us today. We have a huge um, number of folks uh, joining us today, which is great. My slides are kind of slow, so there might be a little lag. We're going to do a little housekeeping. One hour of CEU is available from both CDR and NEHA. You can download the certificate right during the webinar, right now, if you want, from the sidebar on the right of your screen. It looks like this. Um, or you can go to fightback.org, um, click on the free resources tab, recorded webinars, and these certificates and the recording and the slides will be available within 48 hours. Some more housekeeping. During the webinar, to ask a question, use the questions box on the right side of your screen. You can submit questions throughout the webinar. We'll just answer them at the Q&A at the end. After the webinar, we will send you a brief evaluation survey, and we uh, hopefully you will fill it out. We really want to continue to develop the best webinars for you. Our learning objectives today are to describe the food safety recommendations noted in the 2015 Dietary Guidelines also to identify foods implicated in foodborne illness outbreaks, and to provide examples of retail efforts to educate consumers on good nutrition and proper food safety practices. So we're going to kick it off with a poll. Are you eligible for our CEUs? A lot of folks appreciate free CEUs, uh, and if yes, which one? So we're going to launch that poll. So which one are you eligible for? I'll leave it open for about 10 more seconds. And then we'll see what the results are. Okay, thank you for entering that poll. Boy, we had a lot of RDs or DTRs on the on the um, webinar today. Sixty-one percent, four percent are uh, going to be getting the NEHA credit um, certificate, and two percent have both. Excellent, and thirty-three percent are not doing it for the uh, credential. Great. Well, thank you so much for um, taking that poll, and now we're going to get into the the meat of things. Here we go. I'd like to again introduce Janet M. DeJesus from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And Janet is going to um, present her slides. Okay. I'm not seeing the screen, Mary. No, you're not seeing the screen. I'm not quite sure where the screen went. Um, that doesn't okay. work. Oh, I may you know just have you. Um, yeah, I'll just I'll just advance them for you, Janet. You just tell me when to advance. Okay, sounds great. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here, and thanks, and Mary, for the invitation. 
Um, so the Dietary Guidelines 2015-2020, this is the eighth edition. For the past five years, um, the Department of Health and Human Services has led the development of this edition of the Dietary Guidelines with our great partners at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So this latest edition was released this past January, and I'm happy to share with you some of the critical messages and applications. As important stakeholders, we recognize that you share a vested interest with us in protecting the health of all Americans. So next slide. Just getting a little delay. Okay. Here. So the objectives that I'm going to discuss briefly, um, I'm going to go over the overview of the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, review the history of food safety recommendations in the guidelines, and review current food safety recommendations in the latest version. Next slide. Okay. So the Dietary Guidelines, um, what is it and what isn't? Um, the main purpose of the Dietary Guidelines is to inform the development of federal food, nutrition, and health policies and programs. It is written for policymakers as well as nutrition and health professionals, not consumers. The focus of the recommendations is for disease prevention, not to treat disease. It is also not regulation, and it doesn't um, have the authority to direct regulations, um, but it can be used by agencies in their own development of regulations. Okay, next slide. So now I'm going to give you a broad overview of um, the dietary guidelines um, in the beginning, and then I'm going to get into the food safety recommendations. So next slide. Okay, so the contents um, in this edition um, starts off with an executive summary, followed by an introduction in three chapters and 14 appendices. So there's really a wealth of information. Um, this edition looks at healthy eating patterns from three vantage points. Um, in Chapter 1, we examine um, what the eating patterns are with examples of adaptable um, ways um, to adapt the eating patterns to personal taste, traditions, and budgets. In Chapter 2, we explore the shifts needed to more closely align with healthy eating patterns based on current consumption. And finally, in Chapter 3, we provide um, a call to action across sectors to support healthy eating patterns in the United States. So next slide. So what are the guidelines? Um, the 2015-2020 Dietary Guidelines provide five overarching goals. The first three of these focus on Chapter 1 in the Dietary Guidelines. They are follow a healthy eating pattern across the lifespan. So in this chapter, or in this um, key rec, we talk about how all foods and beverages matter, okay? And within the eating pattern, it's important to choose um, foods that are appropriate in calorie level to maintain and achieve a healthy body weight while supporting nutrition adequacy and reducing risk of chronic disease. Number two, focus on the variety, nutrient density, and amount. So to meet nutrient needs um, within calorie limits, it's important to choose nutrient-dense foods. Um, across and within food groups in the recommended amount. Number three, limit calories from added sugar, saturated fat, and sodium. So it's really important to cut back on these foods and beverages that are higher in these components um, so that they fit in with healthy eating patterns. Next slide. Okay, so guideline four is the focus of chapter two in the policy document. Um, so this focuses on shifting the healthier foods and beverage choices, um, choosing nutrient-dense foods across the food groups, um, and this also takes into consideration cultural and personal preferences to make these shifts um, that um, Americans are able to accomplish and maintain. Chapter five is, um, guideline five is the focus of chapter three. So this is um, supporting healthy eating patterns for all. And the focus on this chapter and guideline is really that everyone has a role in helping to create and support healthy eating patterns in multiple settings nationwide. So from home to school to work and communities, we all have a role. Okay, next slide. So aligning the dietary guidelines, what does this mean in practice? So it's really important to take um, the actions at their entirety and maintain them over time. 
um, make food and beverage choices that meet key recommendations. Um, so really looking at the food groups, the subgroups, and other components. Um, in combination, these contribute to the overall healthy eating patterns. Um, it's important to meet nutrition needs primarily through foods. Establish and maintain settings. So for example, homes, school, work sites, restaurants, and stores. All of these settings play a role in um, providing accessibility for healthy dietary patterns. Um, so here you can see um, a food safety guidance. Ensure that food is kept safe by using the principles that we'll discuss later, clean, separate, cook, and chill. Um, and finally, establishing and maintaining sectors and settings that support and encourage regular physical activity as part of a healthy lifestyle. So as you can see, we're really calling to action um, to get our community partners across the nation to help change social norms and values um, that can support prevention to support a healthy lifestyle paradigm. Okay, so next I'm going to go into the history of food safety recommendations and the dietary guidelines for Americans. Next. Okay, so looking back to 1980, so you can see these are the key recommendations that were in the dietary guidelines. Um, in 2000, that's when um, the, the key recommendation came to keep foods safe that we eat. The next slide. So in 2005, the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee, um, this was when a rigorous evidence review um, was introduced into the process. You can see that there's a number of food safety evidence review questions, and um, all of the data from, from the answers to these questions are available in this advisory committee report um, that can be found on dietaryguidelines.gov. So I'll briefly go through the questions and then um, the guidance that was in the 2005 guideline. So first, um, what behaviors are most likely to prevent food safety problems? And also, um, in terms of how food is handled, what behaviors are most likely to cause food safety problems, such as foodborne illness? Some of these topics, sub-questions included looking at the effectiveness of bacterial cleansers, um, what data is available on cleaning fruits and vegetables, Number two was what topics, if um, any, um, need attention, even though um, they may not be a part of the current Fight Back campaign. Okay, next slide. So from the evidence review um, that the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee um, worked on um, and published in their report, and these are the 2005 Dietary Guidelines Food Safety Recommendations. And of course, you, recommend, you, rec you probably recognize these. Um, to avoid uh, microbial foodborne illness, the, the four key principles, um, clean, separate, cook, chill. Um, in addition, um, there, were, there was guidance on avoiding raw milk, um, any unpasteurized, partially cooked eggs, and foods that also contain raw eggs, undercooked meat and poultry, underpasteurized juices, and raw sprouts. In addition, there was um, some great information for special population groups. Um, so take a look if you haven't seen it. Um, there's information on um, infants, young children, pregnant women, and older adults. Okay, next slide. So in 2010, um, the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee you know, looked at the um, 2005 report and wanted to see um, what needed to be updated. So these are the um, evidence review questions that the advisory committee looked at. Um, so they did look at the key behaviors again to see if there was any new data. So they had questions on the main principles, clean, um, separate, cook, chill. They also looked at um, avoiding risky behaviors. Um, for example, to what extent do consumers eat raw or undercooked animal foods? In addition, they looked at um, to what extent do subpopulations practice unsafe food safety behaviors? Because really seeing, um, it's just like looking at current intake, it's also seeing what behaviors um, Americans are doing so we can provide guidance in the, in the guidelines document. Um, and finally, there was a question on um, recently developed technological materials. Um, designed to improve food safety. So really looking at how effective these are 
at reducing exposure to, pathog to pathogens. Okay, next slide. So the 2010 Dietary Guidelines, um, so this is the food safety guidance. As you can see, it's um, some of the similar information from 2005, um, but it was good that the data available reinforced these key principles of um, clean, separate, cook, chill, um, keeping food at safe temperatures, avoiding ris um, risky foods. There was um, limited evidence on the food safety technology. So for example, those are like special washes for fruits and vegetables. So really, the um, guidance in 2010 was um, you know, to wash fruits and vegetables, and then if you see spills, just clean them right away. Um, you know, and scrub them well. So if you have a spill on the counter, for example, like um, like juice from raw chicken or something, it's just important to to keep surfaces clean to avoid cross contamination. Next slide. Okay. So moving forward to 2015, 2020. Um, so so looking at the 2010 um, guidelines um, in the food safety area. Um, it was agreed by the committee that most of these principles are really set in stone. There wasn't much new evidence to actually change um, most of the food safety guidance. So the key principles, again, um, from Fight Back, the cornerstones of Fight Back, um, again, were brought forward um, in the 2015-2020. And there were a few minor changes, which I'll discuss on the, um, the next slide. But definitely take a look um, in the appendices of the dietary guidelines because there's a lot of information. So all of this information is also reinforced by USDA education materials um, at, at Be Food Safe, um, Is It Done Yet, and also the um, FSIS Thermi. Next slide. Okay, um, additional consumer-friendly information can be found at foodsafety.gov. And just to share the updates that were included in the 2015 version of the Dietary Guidelines, um, we updated some information on hand sanitation, washing fresh produce, preventing cross-contamination, and a few of the temperatures were changed. So we did update the, the cooking temperatures and thermometer use. And all of this information was um, provided by the Food and Drug Administration, the Center for Disease Control, and FSIS, Food Safety and Inspection Service at USDA. Next slide. So this is just an example, and there's a wealth of knowledge in the Dietary Guidelines Appendix 14 for food safety. So definitely take a look. These are just some um, examples of um, safe internal temperatures in which food should be cooked. Um, key temperatures for holding foods, um, how long they should be kept or can be kept out of the safe zone, etc. Next slide. And this is just a, a laundry list of the food safety guidance provided in the 2015-2020 guideline. So the main food safety principles, um, hand washing, um, how to clean surfaces, appliances, and foods recommended safe internal temperatures, um, principles for separating foods when shopping, prep, and service, and an overview of risky behaviors in specific populations that are at increased risk for foodborne illness. Okay, so thanks so much. I'm going to pass it back over to Mary, and we'll, I'm happy to take questions at the end of the presentation. Great. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Janet. Um, just to finish up Janet's um, presentation, I'm just curious, we're just curious, did you know there was an appendix of food safety guidance in the latest USDA um, guidelines, um, U.S. Dietary Guidelines? We're going to launch a poll and see how many of you already knew about that or whether this is new information. So will take about 10 more seconds to give you enough time to uh, Okay, so we're going to close the poll, and um, 
let's see, about 27% of you knew that there was a, um, a appendix on food safety, but 61% didn't. So Janet, fantastic. So this is good um, that you know it's there and you can go look it up and, uh, and check it out because it's full of information. And 12% weren't sure. Okay. So now let's move along to the next part of the presentation. So I'll be presenting next part. Again, I'm Mary Saucier Choate with the Partnership for Food Safety Education, and I'm an MSRD. So just, you know, nothing new here. Uh, what do we think of as good nutrition, right? Um, lots of different ideas about good nutrition. Um, you know, to eat for disease, like for DASH, for high blood pressure, or diabetes plate, or culturally, like the Mediterranean diet, or the vegetarian pyramid, or follow the general dietary guidelines. And believe it or not, there seems to be general agreement on what makes up a healthy diet. Um, and I can say this with some conviction because Old Ways I did a big a conference last year and they had a group of leading nutrition and food systems experts and they actually reached a consensus. In fact, Dr. Walter Willett at Harvard, he was the conference co-chair and he said it was remarkable that they achieved this much consensus. And here's what they uh, agreed on. That a healthy diet includes abundant nuts, vegetables, uh, fruits, whole grains, legumes, and minimal amounts of refined starch, sugar, and red meat, and especially processed red meat. So that's a lot of common ground. Um, also, uh, Dr. Katz and a fellow researcher, Meller, looked at six different diets um, and, again, looked at the, what was common to them. And, what, again, they found the same thing they found at the conference. Uh, limited refined starches, limited added sugars and processed foods, limited certain fats, the emphasis was on whole plant foods and with or without lean meat, fish, poultry, seafood. So um, Dr. Katz kind of summed it up with a uh, eat food, not too much, mostly plants, of course, um, from Michael Pollan in defense of food. But it's true. The, the consensus seems to be whole foods are, are a diet mainly in whole foods is the healthiest diet. So also, no surprise on the benefits of good nutrition, right? We all know this. Um, can reduce the risk of heart disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, can reduce cancers, can reduce um, the risk of developing kidney stones, help improve bone health, and help lower cholesterol levels. So we all know what the benefits of good nutrition are. But here's the part that I'm pretty passionate about. A foodborne illness can completely undermine good nutrition and its positive effects on health. And uh, people who educate on nutrition and food safety can do a lot to help prevent this. One thing a lot of us already know about the short-term effects of foodborne illness are the common symptoms, you know, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, fever, and chills. Um, you may or may not know how many people get affected. One in six Americans get sick each year. So it's, um, that's about 17%. That's kind of a, a number we want to definitely work on getting lower. Most people get these um, symptoms that last for a few hours to several days when they get uh, foodborne illness. You might not be aware of the long-term effects of foodborne illness. Now, most people recover without these lasting effects, but some people do experience serious and chronic and sometimes lethal effects, and they can include kidney failure, brain and nerve damage, arthritis, paralysis in the muscles that control breathing, spontaneous abortion or stillbirth. And one that um, you might not know is irritable bowel syndrome can be um, kicked off by about a foodborne illness. Also, certain um, bugs can increase risks of high blood pressure, kidney problems, and cardiovascular disease. So um, a lot of people don't realize there are potentially long-term effects in foodborne illness. Also, of course, 3,000 people a year die from the effects of foodborne illness. So it's pretty serious. So what we can do as educators is teach consumers to handle nutritious foods safely to decrease their risk of foodborne illness. All the nutritious foods we've been talking about have been involved in foodborne illness outbreaks. I'm just going to briefly list a couple of them on the next few slides. Um, unpasteurized milk from 2007 to 2012, there were 81 outbreaks. You can see almost 1,000 illnesses, 73 hospitalizations, no deaths. Uh, Campylobacter was the pathogen there. Unpasteurized cheese, again, looking at a number of years from 93 to 2006, 27 outbreaks, 641 illnesses, 131 hospitalizations, two deaths, and that was 
due to Campylobacter and Salmonella. Um, with protein foods, ground beef, shell eggs, and yellowfin tuna, but there's every protein food has been involved um, over the years. Um, in 2014, there were five outbreaks around ground beef, 87 illnesses, 27 hospitalizations, one death. <clears throat> shell eggs in 2010, there's one huge outbreak resulting in about 2,000 illnesses. In this case, um, it's interesting if, if if you're interested in this at all, going to this, um, this uh, reference is very interesting. They found the number of outbreaks increased dramatically over the previous five years. So they sort of had to, um, this is a, that's why the little uh, approximation sign in front of that number, but they figured about 1,939 illnesses were caused by this um, salmonella in the eggs. And in frozen yellowfin tuna just last year, one outbreak caused 65 illnesses and 11 hospitalizations. Um, a lot of folks don't think about grains when they think of foodborne illness, um, but they definitely have to be handled uh, carefully, just like every other food. Uh, fried rice, excuse me, <clears throat> this was in 1993. One outbreak caused 14 illnesses, no hospitalizations, no deaths, but, uh, and this is a pathogen with the killer series. But the the thing that I, not, I didn't spell out here is that 12 of those illnesses were in, this is at a child care center, two child care centers actually. Um, 12 of the 14 illnesses were in children between two and a half and five years of age. So it's just miraculous that there were no hospitalizations and no deaths with a foodborne illness. <clears throat> and then most recently, of course, the recall on flour because of um, E. coli. So far, 38 illnesses, 10 hospitalizations, and no deaths. So this is um, something to, to pay attention to that even, you know, we used to think, oh, don't eat, uh, don't eat batter because of the eggs. But really, flour is a raw agricultural product, and it has to be handled like that and cooked before eating. Then uh, fruits and vegetables, which we are desperately trying to get people to eat more of, again, they have to be handled properly. So there was an outbreak uh, starting in 2013 till now, frozen vegetables, one outbreak that caused eight illnesses, eight hospitalizations, two deaths caused by listeria. Cucumbers last year, one outbreak called, caused 907 illnesses, 204 hospitalizations, six deaths. And um, in 2012, whole cantaloupes resulted in 147 illnesses, 143 hospitalizations, 33 deaths. Um, so all these great foods, if not handled properly, can cause foodborne illness. We can have a really strong role in helping to reduce the risk to consumers by making sure we educate on food, safe food handling along with nutrition education. It shouldn't be in a silo separated, but you should definitely be intertwined. Um, to kick off this next section, we have another poll question to ask you. How do you incorporate food safety information into your education efforts? So we're going to open that poll. And give you about 20 seconds or so to um, tell us whether you discuss it in cooking classes or put it in recipes or write about it when you're talking about health or don't usually discuss food safety or talk about it only with the high uh, risk groups you work with. We'll leave it open for about 10 more seconds. OK, let's see what, we, what you told us. OK, it looks like a lot of you, 47% discuss it in cooking classes, yay. 36% put it in recipe instructions, that's fabulous. 39% um, write about it when talking about uh, health. 16% um, don't usually discuss food safety, and 23% talk about it with high risk groups only. Well, that's great. There's a lot of um, integration already going on. That's fantastic. Okay. 
So let's continue on. Um, I want to talk just a little bit um, about some government programs that have um, food safety somewhat integrated. Um, on FDA.gov, you can see this food safety for moms to be. They have a lot of information around uh, pregnancy and pre-pregnancy and um, keeping babies and mothers safe. So this particular um, page talks about the different food groups. And I'm looking over here at food safety for moms to be. Uh, and go through that they're important and how to keep them safe. On the left, you see that What's Cooking USDA Mixing Bowl, which I thought was, everyone knew about, but I'm learning that it's not, so I'm glad to tell you about this. This is, um, they used to be the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP-Ed Recipe Finder, that's been folded into this tool, the What's Cooking USDA Mixing Bowl. And it's a, a great tool for a number of reasons. You can set it up to have meals cost a certain amount or be a certain, for certain, um, cultural style of cooking and so forth. And at the bottom of that page, the USDA Mixing Bowl, they have this tip, find tips and resources right in, um, there. So while the recipes themselves don't necessarily have the information integrated right there, at least on the bottom of this page, they're featuring um, a food safety link. Um, trying to advance here. There we go. Now, this is, again, from food safety Gov. Janet mentioned this um, great resource. This is a recipe they have on this uh, site. And I have so many red circles because it is like the perfect recipe. Okay, so they start off by saying how to start. Clean the work area, wash your hands and surfaces, use separate cutting boards, and why. Then when they're talking about marinating the chicken, put it in the refrigerator. And then down below in step four, um, check the internal temperature of the chicken. Make sure it's 165 with a food thermometer. And then after cooking, hold the food at 140. So fantastic instructions here. Down the bottom, when you have the um, marinade, bring it to a boil to kill all the pathogens. And then after you're done eating, divide the leftovers, refrigerate it within two hours, use the leftovers within three to four days. I give this recipe an A++. Uh, no, if a consumer did something wrong, it would be their own fault, because everything is spelled out here so clearly. Um, this is like a key a key tool that we can use to help consumers um, to hit all the food safety steps to keep themselves safe. Now, this, again, on foodsafety.gov, this is um, something called the recipe tool. And I think it's a great tool for educators like us who really have a good idea of the, um, the clean, separate, cook, chill steps. Um, so if you are like copying recipes to bring to a class because they're healthy, you might want to consider using this tool to cue you in to so you hit all the food safety steps. So what you would do, you can put in the recipe name and ingredients. You can see that. Um, but you don't have to because nothing's going to change. What's going to change is um, under the directions. If you cut, cut and paste the um, directions from your recipe, put it in this tool, hit submit, you will get this. Now, that's why this I would not give to a consumer because it's too confusing. But for us, you everywhere you see the, um, the green symbol with the arrows, that's so let's talk about uh, separating um, uh, so you don't cross-contaminate. Wherever you see the little drop of water, it's talking about washing your hands. So you can see it right at the beginning. You can also see it within the body of the recipe after you're touching the chicken. So you can mention washing your hands. Um, whenever you see chicken, you see the thermometer symbols. You can mention the temperature it needs to be cooked to. And again, don't cross-contaminate. Um, and then down the bottom, you see the chill sticker, um, the chill icon. That's where you can talk about refrigerating your leftovers. Um, at the right temperature and within two hours. So this is a great tool for people who are uh, educating around nutrition using recipes to cue you into the things you might want to adapt into your recipe to um, get that food safety information right, right in the recipe. Now retailers are doing some, some great work as well. And while most of us here might not be retailers, um, you they have some great ideas you can transfer to health fairs or grocery store tours or other ways that you're um, putting information out to consumers. So we're going to focus on just three retailers, Meyer, Publix, and Kroger. Um, they're uh, supporters of the Partnership for Food Safety Education, which says something about them right there. And they, um, they're doing some interesting things. So we're just going to go over a few of their things. Um, I just took a few examples. They do much more than this. So Meyer, just if you don't know about them, they're a leading Midwest super center, 200 stores, more than 70,000 employees. They're the 19th largest 
privately held company in the country. So they are reaching a lot of people. One thing they do is um, put out this cookbook for food pantry use. Um, they distribute it in English and Spanish throughout um, food pantries and food banks across the Midwest. And they have a whole chapter on food safety and storage. So that's a, a good way to do that. They also have a lot of registered dietitians on staff that do a lot of outreach. Um, and here's a couple of examples. On the right, you can see they're doing a TV spot, and she's talking about grilling. So that's where you could take that idea and bring it to a health fair or to a table wherever you're um, meeting with consumers. You could have a grill, talk about what's healthy to grill, and also how to you, how to um, handle that food properly so it's food safe, you know, using the thermometer, washing your hands, cleaning surfaces, and so forth. On the left, they're doing an in-store demo of uh, picnicking and, and traveling with food so you can have, you see the um, coolers and the ice packs and the containers and the hand wipes. So that's another way you can do an interesting and maybe seasonally appropriate um, health fair outreach or um, wherever you might be doing the table. On their website, um, they continue the food safety message. This is meals and snacks for camping. A lot of times when we go outside, we sort of forget about the food safety uh, practices that are still needed. So here they, they do that. They um, talk about food safety tips for eating outside, all the things we've talked about. Moving on to Publix, again, just to familiarize you with them, they have over 1,100 stores and they're in the southeast, largest employee-owned grocery chain in the U.S one of the 10 largest supermarket chains in the country, and they have over 180,000 employees. So again, big reach um, with their food safety education. What I focused on with uh, one of the things they're doing is reaching out to teens. Um, they worked with newspapers and education and uh, distributed over almost half a million food safety curriculum programs for high school teachers. And the way they focused it on teens especially is this um, cool thing. They had a public chill checker attached to the newspapers that they hand out to each of the kids. And they had to take a selfie with this chill checker. You put it in your refrigerator and it turns the color, if it stays blue, it shows that your um, refrigerator is 40 degrees or less. So they encourage kids to join a contest and take a picture with the chill checker at the right color. But this is an idea, again, that we can um, borrow um, to get to teens. You know, teens, a camera, and selfies, and you've got like halfway there to getting to the teens. So you could have them do a selfie of um, how the refrigerator is packed safely, or a video of washing your hands safely, or um, even a music video. I mean, kids can be really creative about um, food safety ideas. Um, so I just wanted to share that, because teens are a hard, a hard group to get to sometimes. Again, Publix also has a lot of food safety information on their website. And the last um, uh, one we're going to take some ideas from is Kroger. They're based in Cincinnati. Again, one of the largest retailers in the U.S. They operate almost 3,000 supermarkets in Midwest and Southern United States, and they have about 431,000 staff. So again, they're doing a lot of, reaching a lot of people with their education. Um, Kroger worked with the Partnership for Food Safety Education uh, to do a week-by-week -week food safety education month plan. And they focused on using Produce Pro. And that is a program that is free to anyone to go to the um, Fight Back site. And you can download these great, colorful materials that have the six steps to taking care of produce properly. And they put posters of this in 124 of their Michigan stores. Another clever thing they do is they make good use of their chef, who is also a food safety manager, um, John. And he um, does video segments targeting kids in order to get to their parents to um, help them change food safety behaviors. And he also records food safety announcements that play every 30 minutes in Kroger stores. And while you might not be um, able to do public service announcements in your grocery store, I thought, what a great idea for when you're doing a grocery store tour yourself. You can, as you go through each of the food groups, you can add the information about using, uh, handling these foods safely. Um, and again, also, if you're going into a, a school and teaching kids, we have tons of materials you can use for kids to learn about food safety and then bring that home to their parents. This is like my favorite thing that a retailer has done. They used our myth versus fact, our myth busters um, series, and had a display. And you can see one of the parts of the display is uh, cookie dough. The myth is that kids can eat cookies, bad or no problem, and when really just a lick can make you sick. So they had the 
the information on a, a poster, and then they had the cookie dough right there. So this is a really effective way to get to consumers. And again, this would be a great um, health fair table or outreach table. OK, so wrapping that part up, we're wondering which food safety behaviors do you teach about the most? So we're going to launch that poll. Do you teach about hand washing, preventing cross-contamination, storing perishable foods at the right temperature, or checking uh, for proper temperatures with a thermometer? Just leave that open for about 10 more seconds. OK, I guess we'll close that poll now and see what, uh, what you said. So it looks like um, hand washing was the most taught about behavior, followed by ooh, using a, uh, a temperature thermometer, a food thermometer to test for temp. 17% teach about preventing cross-contamination mostly, and 10% talk about uh, keeping the refrigerator at the right temperature. OK. Great. So let's move on. I can't leave this part of the presentation without telling you about the great free science-based resources at uh, fightback.org. Um, some of the ones I've already shown you in the presentation, but for example, we just revamped our core four fact sheet. So they're, um, they're colorful. They're like a little mini class on each, each handout. Um, and they cover clean, separate, cook, and chill great graphics, um, and all of our handouts are vetted by you know, government food safety experts, academia experts, and industry experts. So you know what you're handing out is going to be completely uh, valid and science-based. We talked about the Produce Pro that's available, materials, go 40 or below, for um, helping to teach people why they need to keep their refrigerator at the right temperature. And this one, uh, Cook It Safe, is around microwave cooking. This is my biggest fear for consumers. If they're not, if they don't know how to cook, and many don't, but they microwave everything, they might not realize that there's some things they need to know in the food safety realm around keeping themselves safe. I'm using a food thermometer, not microwaving things that they don't microwave. Um, so this Cook It Safe piece, again, that's on the Fight Back website, and it is in Spanish and English, so that's a, a good thing to know. So now is the part of the presentation when we are I'm going to try to answer your questions um, that you've submitted. If you haven't submitted questions, now would be a great time to do that. And uh, remember to use uh, the question box to submit questions uh, for myself or for Janet DeJesus. So I'm not seeing any questions right now, but um, Shelly, I'm wondering if you would unmute yourself because I'm not seeing the question box. Um, okay. I'm, I'm happy to read out some questions if you'd like, Mary. That would be fantastic. Okay. Um, and then I can, uh, there was a good, you know, I, I can assign them to either you or to um, Janet. I think there was one on the guidelines. Um, first of all, Mary, why don't you just start with, there's a general question and we'll get some other ones about where do they get the handout to slide for this presentation? Oh, fantastic. I'm so happy to answer that question. It just is so easy. On the right of your screen, um, you can see a, um, a bar that says handouts two of five. There are two handouts there. If you click the little plus sign, it'll open up for you. There's two PDFs. One is if you're, down, if you're taking the webinar for uh, CDR CEUs, you can click on that and download it right now to your computer. Or if you're uh, attending to get the NEHA certificate, you can, again, click there. So that's a good place. I did find the question, Shelly. I, the, my little, I, I opened up my question, so. Um, uh, let's, I'll give this one to Jan, and then you can figure out which one you want to answer next. Okay, uh, very good. Is it possible to get a print version of the dietary guidelines 
or are they only available to download? Um, would you answer that, Janet? Sure. I believe there is a um, print version in production, and you should be able to order it online. Um, I'm not seeing a place to order it at the moment, um, but if you sign up for updates from the 2015 um, dietary guidelines, I'm sure that they will notify the public when the print version is available. Okay. Thanks, Janet. Um, I see a question. These are just great questions. Doesn't wash, does not washing meat and poultry also include seafood? Some people wash fish before cooking. And washing anything in the sink, anything that has potential contamination on it, is just um, going to have the same problem, where it's going to splash and contaminate the area around the sink. Um, so that would be, um, the answer would be don't wash fish either. Because anything that's going to contaminate, anything that's on the fish will be killed. Um, any kind of bacteria will be killed by the cooking temperature. OK. Um, where do we get the slides? Okay, those are going to be posted on our website uh, after I go to Fight Back, and um, you'll be able to find those. And the PowerPoint, yes, the PowerPoint will be there. Let's see. Okay. Oh, that recipe, oh, the recipe that I showed, this is great, um, does not say not to wash the chicken. That should, that would be an excellent thing to add. So if you have a recipe, you can specify, that includes chicken, you can definitely specify, do not wash the chicken. Um, I think that's a great addition. Okay. Let's see. Okay, Sorry. someone asked you materials. Oh, go ahead, Shelly. Yeah. I just wanted to ask questions. <laughs> so you can, you can go you can, Yeah, you can go ahead and ask them. I mean, let me just do this one. You can do the um, after. Um, do you have materials that you can recommend that are appropriate for community college students? And I would recommend checking out fightback.org. There are a lot of materials that are appropriate for um, adults, and including those, those uh, core four fact sheets that we just redid. Those would be really good for community college students. They're colorful and um, and well laid out. Uh, there's a question of, of, from Karen about, does warm water actually help kill germs on hands, or is it just for comfort? So to give a very, we did a, a great hand washing webinar in February with a lot of detail about the science behind the efficacy of different hand washing um, practices. So I would encourage you to check that out. I would also answer this question quickly, but just say that um, water temperature is not really a factor in getting germs off of hands. It is more for comfort. Um, uh, the length of time you wash your hands does matter. So uh, again, if you want more detail and the science behind hand washing, um, you should check out our recorded webinar page, and you can find a great uh, full presentation on the science behind uh, hand washing. Okay, there's a question about from Jen about which food thermometer is recommended. Uh, there are so many choices, um, and I don't. My to my understanding, digital or analog, neither is better than the other. Whichever one you use, that is the big deal. Is using the food thermometer. Okay. This is Shelley again. There's a question from Cindy about, do we send out educational resources, or is everything available to print ourselves from your website? Um, the Partnership for Food Safety Education does not mail material, and we do not have an online store um, anymore. So we are creating a lot of terrific printer-ready PDFs. There's many, many, many of them at fightback.org. And you should know that permission is not required for you to take those files and print them and distribute them um, to your community. Mary? Yep. Um, now, here's one for you, Janet. Do the guidelines address the topic of not preparing food for others while experiencing foodborne illness symptoms? 
Can you talk about that, Janet? Not preparing hmm. food for others while you're ill with foodborne illness. Yeah, I would have to look that up. It's a good yeah. question. I don't recall seeing that in the guidance. Yeah. I could take a quick right. look, though. Yeah. Okay. Well, and Mary, what do you recommend <laughs> for that? Oh, I would recommend not. <laughs> okay. Not for yeah. Food for others. Yeah, um, I mean, I assume. You know, I, I just, yeah, I, I wonder if they're going to be talking more about, um, you know, food safety. We keep learning more and more. So the next dietary guidelines, they may well be talking about norovirus and things like that. But I don't know that this, these guidelines included that much of a discussion. Um, okay, I'm just looking. These are such great questions. I have to read fast. Let's see. Um, okay, in the food outbreak statistics, is that because of a grocery retailer or restaurant, or does that include individual household mishandling of food? My question is related to the foods that seem uncommon in food safety outbreaks like cantaloupe. You know, food safety um, outbreak statistics can be from a number of places along the food chain, right? It, um, the food has to be cared for properly from farm to fork. So if there's a breakdown or a misstep, in any of those places, that's where the outbreak can happen. So yes, the outbreak statistics include however you get sick, but sometimes we can pinpoint it to a certain place in the food chain, and sometimes it's throughout the food chain if people mishandle it all the way down the line. Or you know, usually a foodborne illness outbreak, if it's just in your home that you say someone leaves the chicken out for too long and then eats it, that wouldn't be an outbreak if it's just in your home because you did something. Um, but the outbreak would normally be an outbreak because more people are affected because it has one point like a restaurant or some other um, larger distributor that causes an outbreak. Yeah, Mary, I think an important point to make here is when people see outbreak data from the CDC, that that does not include what's called sporadic cases. It should be like small, like a family doing something. Right. right. So that's, that's one of the, you know, kind of the flaws in our overall foodborne illness. Uh, data uh, or you know illness is that a lot of the sporadic cases are are not um, so much captured, which is why all this work is really important because we know they occur and um, we know they can be the result of people not consistently doing these core four practices. Right. Someone's looking for sources for inexpensive fridge and meat thermometers. Um, I cannot think of any. However, this is what I did when I was a grocery store dietitian. When I would go to conferences like um, uh, the AND conference, I would like go to tables, and it's like the egg board had a bunch of te like temporary um, thermometers for a refrigerator. They last like a year. I would get a bunch of them and bring them to my food safety classes and just tell people, here, you can start with this one. You'll want it replace it in a year with a real one. Um, for meat thermometers, I got a distributor at our store to donate a bunch of them for my classes. So I guess it's looking to people who would benefit from getting um, some good press from giving out like, meat thermometers or refrigerator thermometers and, and, and asking them if they have any to donate. That would, I can't think of any place that has discount ones. Um, best way to clean a food thermometer, um, that's with a hot, a soapy water. Um, right after you use it is best. Okay. Um, oh my, I just went to the wrong direction on the questions. Let me go back down again. Okay. Okay, still looking at your wonderful questions. Oh, someone asked, can you repeat where the slides will be available again, please? I am happy to. Um, within 48 hours, they will be on the Fight Back website under uh, recorded webinars. That will be the um, slides, the CEU certificates and the recording. Okay. Where do you get a copy of the new guidelines? Oh, I'll let Janet answer that. Janet, where do you get a copy of the new dietary guidelines? Sure. I just took a look. I did not see an order form, um, but the um, the PDF is available now online. Um, and if you sign up for um, updates from the 2015 guidelines, I'm sure they'll send out a note when it's available for print. And if I do hear um, that it's available, I can let Mary know and she can put it on a listserv. 
yeah, I'll put it on listservs and I'll you know put it on Facebook and Twitter too. Great. Great. Let's see. So just like one more question, I guess, before just running out of time. Um, are there any resources you can recommend to help educate staff in a residential treatment facility for needy adolescents? Yes. Um, all the websites we talked about, including um, the Fight Back website, um, has information that would be helpful for staff to see as well. The, the basic four are always helpful. Um, and in fact, I don't, this is, you asked about staff, but there's also uh, materials for adolescents, curriculums for grade K through 12 um, that could pieces could be pulled out if you're interested in teaching adolescents about uh, food safety as well. Okay, way more questions than um, we could have time to answer. Um, but I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, I want to make sure that you're aware of um, upcoming events from uh, the Partnership for Food Safety Education. On July 21st at 1 p.m., we're going to have a knowledge exchange about called What About Produce Washes? Knowledge exchanges are teleconferences that last about 30 minutes. And we'll talk to an expert about them and find out what the latest is. September 13th at 1 p.m., we're going to have another Fight Back Brown Bag webinar focusing really deeply onto Recipe Redo, supporting consumers with food safe recipes. There's been some uh, important research done around this on and how it really helps consumers to do food safety behaviors at home. Um, and so we'll get into that. And please mark your calendars for January 25th through 27th of 2017 in Washington, D.C., the Consumer Food Safety Education Conference. Um, the focus of this conference is going to be advancing food safety through behavior change. And if you're a food safety educator, this is the, the, the conference for you. Um, if you want to get announcements like this, um, please uh, join our e-list. If you go to Fight Back, it's our sign-up page is right at the bottom of the page is the um, form to sign up. And we just want to thank our um, sponsoring partners and our Backfighter Community Connectors for their support. We couldn't do it without the support of these organizations. And with that, I want to thank Janet, Janet DeJesus. Thank you so much for joining us today, Janet. And thank you, Shelley Feist of the Partnership for Food Safety Education for helping us behind the scenes. And we hope you'll join us again. Thanks. It was my pleasure.